Um, thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for your kind welcome. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a... I'm going to do this uh, talk about SASR. I'm going to do it in two parts. Um, so, um, anyone brave enough to tell me what SASR stands for? No, I didn't think so. That's all right. Uh, well done. Very good. Do you know what the RAF call airmen and airwomen nowadays? Aviators. So, you'll hear that phrase. Um, not yet. Oh, maybe it's the other way. Oh, it's that way. Okay. Um, 1816. Great date. Um, you won't read about this in the uh, history books. Only a year after the Battle of Waterloo, but a great date for Christians in this country. There was um, a sergeant uh, called Sergeant Rudd. He was in Woolwich Barracks, um, and he was a Christian. Um, he could have fought at Waterloo, we don't know, but he, um, he was concerned for his fellow soldiers. All he did was he wrote a note to put on a notice board at Woolwich Barracks. It said something like, if anyone would like to borrow a Bible, please see me, Sergeant Rudd. That's all he did. He could have had no idea of how God used that tiny, small act of faith. First thing that happened, he got into terrible trouble with the commandant. Uh, he hadn't asked permission to put the note up. The commandant didn't like him, didn't like Christians. There ended up, and I'm going to cut the story very short, ended up with a tug of war between the commandant at Woolwich Barracks and some Christians in the military. About a year later, a horse and cart arrived outside Woolwich Barracks with crates of boxes. Any idea what was in the crates? Not a trick question, yes. <laughs> Enough Bibles for every room in the barracks. And that's not all, because um, in... Not yet, no. Okay, next one. Can you... Okay, because in 1825, the rules were written for when um, men joined the army. Um, and in those rules, it was stated... Okay. It was stated in those rules that every soldier joining the British army must be offered a prayer book and must be offered a Bible. And that all started with Sergeant Rudd and his little prayer. Um quite remarkable. Um, I can't see, sorry. <laughs> Let's try again. Okay, it seems to be working now. Okay, we'll see what happens. Um, however, that wasn't the end of the story because although soldiers were given Bibles, a group of Christian officers met because they realised there was a problem. Any idea what the problem was? They couldn't read. The soldiers couldn't read. So these Christian officers, right, let's, let's put our money together, pool our resources, and what we're going to do, we're going to pay for Christians to go onto the bases, sit down with the soldiers, and read the soldiers' own Bibles to them. Now, what shall we call these people? We'll call them scripture readers. That's what we'll call them. And Sazra still has scripture readers today. We regard our birth date as being about 1838, when the job of a scripture reader was actually written down. Scripture readers have permission from the British Army to wear uniform. They've all served. You can just about see on the lapel a little badge. It's a Sazra badge. When soldiers meet scripture readers, what's the first thing a soldier does? They think about rank. When they meet a scripture reader, they don't know what the rank is, because there isn't one actually. They so, they, so, they, so their first question to a scripture reader is very often, uh, what is a scripture reader? We still have scripture readers today. Our mission hasn't changed since those early days in 1838. And it's simply that, that all serving personnel will hear the gospel whilst they are in uniform. And our scripture readers will help on bases in any way they can. Um, just like you as a local church will help in your community whenever you can. Um, but they're there to be salt and to be light um, on the basis for the men and women of the, uh, the British Armed Forces. Of course, the need is, is, is great, as in all work, um, all Christian work. Um, many, many of the people that we work with, the army recruits up to about 10,000 uh, 17 to 24-year-olds each year. And obviously, there's the RAF too. Um, 
And uh, some of these folk come from the most challenging and difficult areas in British society. Um, for some of them, um, their normal course of life is some kind of addiction, um, crime to fuel that addiction, prison down the line, or they might just make it in the British Army. So some, a proportion, come from extremely challenging backgrounds. Some have an average reading age of under 11. And home backgrounds that are so dysfunctional, dysfunctional isn't an adequate um, word for it. Uh, it's time to just freeze again. Um, amongst the new recruits, this is new recruits, it's estimated, are you able to move it on? No. It's estimated that there are fewer Christians amongst the new recruits than you find in Yemen or Sudan or the most unreached parts of the world. And that's coming from inner city areas, hard, difficult areas in British society. Uh, a number come from those difficult areas. They know nothing about the Bible. They, they've never been to a church like this. They know nothing about Christian things at all. Um, as Lord Dannett said, who was ex-head of the British Army, um, of course, uh, it, what he's saying is we're asking these young people to, to risk their lives and to do so without sharing them about the Christian hope is something of a betrayal. Um, so it's interesting, isn't it, in secular Britain in 2024 that we have this opportunity. We have men and women in army, in, in uniform, going onto army bases, RAF bases, to share their faith, to have Bible studies, to have prayer meetings, to speak to the men and women of the armed forces. Amazing, isn't it? In secular Britain, we have that opportunity. Why? Well, because the, the army are very, in particular, very concerned about these young recruits. Um, about their background, where they come from, they're going to be armed, they're going to be sent to conflict zones, they're going to be shot at. How are they going to respond when they capture people who are shooting at them? Well, they know what's likely to happen. So they're very keen to teach these uh, new recruits, these young people, something that possibly they've never heard before, which is basic Christian moral principles. Every life matters, including the person who's shooting at you self-control, compassion, working as a, a team, th those, kind of, those kind of things. So they have something called the moral component of fighting power. Who's going to teach that to uh, the men and women of the British Army? Well, those scripture readers, they could do that. And so one of the reasons that we uh, uh, are enabled to do what we do is because we're able to teach um, these kind of principles to new recruits. Um, why does SASA exist? Well, essentially, it's, it's simple, really. It's just that you and I can't go on the bases. Uh, we're not allowed. Uh, there are church buildings on the bases, and sometimes they have services, very often not nowadays, I'm afraid. But um, you and I can't go on the bases. Um, but our uh, SASA scripture readers have the privilege of going on the bases, have permission to go on the bases um, to share their faith. And that is part one. Um, I'm going to share with you part two in just a minute. I'm going to read from Psalm 107. Psalm 107, the first few verses, and also a little bit later on in the psalm. Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, said that if this was uh, in any other context, it would be regarded as just a great piece of literature. But of course it is God's word and uh, let's read it together. It's beautifully written. It starts, the psalmist starts, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way, they found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. 
And then down in verse 23. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths, their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that its waves are still. Then they're glad because they are quiet, so he guides them to their desired haven. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Amen. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Sazer today. So that's Sazer in the past, and I'm going to share just a little bit um, about Sazer today before um, we consider um, God's Word together. Um, and we'll see if we can sort of get this working. Okay, yeah, we're doing well. Well, where's Sazer works? Um, so we've got about 16 scripture readers today, and I'm just going to share a little bit about one or two. Um, uh, weren't these, uh, these men and women amazing over the last few years at her late majesty's jubilee, her funeral, the king's coronation? Well, they work out of Hyde Park Barracks um, in London. No. Notes. Oh, yeah. Um, we've got Josh there. Um, Josh is on the right. Um, he uh, is a pastor in Woolwich. Um, but one day a week, he uh, works as Sazra at Hyde Park Barracks. Um, the truth is, Hyde Park Barracks is, is, uh, is quite a challenging place for soldiers to be. Um, it's very demanding. Uh, the uh, ceremonial season is extremely tough for them. Um, and so there are lots of challenges um, at Hyde Park Barracks. Um, Josh has a lot of opportunities there. Uh, he has lots of one-to-one -one meetings. One thing he's done uh, in the last few months is he has a WhatsApp group. Um, and every day he sends out a Bible verse and a devotional to that WhatsApp group. I haven't asked him recently, but he, he was well over 70 people were, 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 were receiving that day on a daily basis, uh, a little Bible verse and a Bible message, which is uh, tremendously encouraging. Um, he's, um, he's written a book, Three Years uh, at War, about his time in Afghanistan. It's a story, the time of his, uh, it's basically his, this, his story, and uh, it's a great read, actually. Um, well worth a look. Um, um, Kevin and Mike um, work at the Jackson Club. Now, the Jackson Club is uh, near Aldershot. It's a cafe. Um, uh, Mike is on the right. He's a scripture reader. Kevin runs the club. Um, uh, it's famous uh, amongst engineers in particular, the Jackson Club. It's famous for cheesy beans. So cheesy beans are lashings of bread, cheese and beans on bread, cheese and beans. Not recommended if you're dieting. Probably not recommended even if you're not. But um, it's, it, it is quite a thing to see the soldiers uh, uh, the Jackson Club, it's not expensive. It's, the food is cheap. And, you know, it's not like they get a plate of cheesy beans. They have burgers and fries with them as well. It is quite <laughs> extraordinary to, to see. But Mike has an office there. And he's able to go out and he's able to uh, just go and meet the soldiers. That's what it's all about, is making relationships, chatting to the soldiers. Um, he has a table which is full of Bibles and tracts and so on. He's constantly replenishing that. Um, at the time of the general election, he put out a, 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 um, a tract which said the only cross that matters, referencing when you're voting, the only cross that matters. He was able to put that out every day and then uh, take, collect, collecting those that remained and put them out again and so on. So he has amazing opportunities there. Um, there it is. It's, it's very full. It's very busy. Uh, the soldiers love it. Um, one of the challenges it has at the minute is um, there's not enough footfall. Um, because soldiers get moved around a lot and there aren't that many people on, on, on the base at the moment and so on and so forth. So um, that's a, a matter of prayer, that there might be enough soldiers coming in to make it work. 
One of the things, of course, that the, 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 the army are very concerned and the RAF is, is the mental health of soldiers. So, so they, they run health fairs. And at health fairs, you'll find um, doctors, um, clinologists of all sorts, psychologists. But SAS are invited to come and talk about spiritual health. And that's Mike behind the table. That's Steve next to him, who's a scripture reader, RAF um, Northholt. They said they have a constant flow of soldiers wanting to know. Many of them don't know anything about uh, Christianity, and they're curious. They want to know. Constant flow of uh, men and women asking about what this, what this is all about. Um, this is a rather shocking statistic, um, but true. Um, that, that more, uh, if you take the Falklands conflict as an example, more soldiers have committed suicide who served in the conflict subsequent to the conflict than actually died in the conflict itself. It's a tremendously sobering thing. It's a problem in society. It's, of course, a great problem in the military. Um, so it means our scripture readers need tremendous wisdom. And many of them are counselling and seeking to meet with soldiers who are very, very needy and very troubled. Um, I'm going to show you a little uh, clip. This is Josh from Hyde Park Barracks. Do you want to try again? No, I'm um, sorry. I think I upset that. Do you want to be... Well, I think there's a beautiful scripture here in Isaiah 26, verse 3, that says, You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Ultimately, as Christians, we know that the, the key to perfect peace is having your mind fixed on the Lord, focused on him. And there are many really good mental health coping strategies um, in the world. Some of them have been tremendously helpful to many people. Um, but from my perspective as a Christian, I think the ultimate um, help that we have to keep our minds in perfect peace isn't to try and create our own peace, but to go to the giver of peace, the God of peace. And so um, our job as a scripture reader is, yes, to help people, yes, to give them, you know, general good uh, uh, advice that, you know, uh, about how to cope with various things. But our aim is to go beyond that and to point them to the God of peace and to introduce them to the God of peace, um, because ultimately we believe that... Uh, he is the one who can keep us in perfect peace. Just thought I'd tell you one more story. This is Tian in the middle. He's a scripture reader. He's at MOD Lynham. All of the young men around him have become Christians in the last uh, uh, 12 months or so, 18 months or so. Really humbling to meet them. These are young. They're all young men, as it happens. There's a couple more others of them. Um, they're very bold in their faith. Um, some of them have come from extremely challenging backgrounds. Um, they're not ashamed to own their Lord. It's very humbling to meet with them. Now, one of them was getting married, and he, he said to Tian Tian, I'd like you to come to my stag do. Young Christians, not from Christian homes. This was a concern for Tian. Right. Okay. Yes, I'm inviting all the, all the lads from the study. There's seven of them. Right. I've got a chalet. I've booked one. Right. It's in Bulgaria. <laughs> What's wrong with the Brecon Beacons anyway? But anyway. Um, right. And why do you want me to come? Tian, I want you to come because I want you to give us seven studies from the Bible on what the Bible teaches about marriage. Isn't that amazing? Tremendous um, transformation in these young men. And some of them leaving Lynham and where they're going, everywhere they're going, they're seeking to have Bible studies, prayer meetings, and so on in the bases that they go to. So great encouragement. Um, okay. okay, so very, very briefly, I'll just say one or two other things because my time's up really. Um, one of the uh, interesting things about Sazra <coughs> is that Her Late Majesty was our patron as was her father, as was her grandfather. Does it matter? Actually, it is important. Sazra has um, plenty of enemies, those who point out to the military, why are you allowing Christians on your bases, giving out Bibles in 2025? 
Um, it, at so, when, those, when those kind of the opposition comes, it's really helpful to say that the commander in chief is our patron. Um, he, uh, the king had the choice. Uh, I, I believe it's true to say a third of Her Late Majesty's royal patronages were were, were uh, divided amongst other royals. A third were, were dropped, I think. I, I believe that's the case. But the king recently wrote back to Sazer saying that he would like to continue with the royal patronage, which is quite an interesting thing, and thanking Sazra for prayer for him um, as well. Um, the big need for, for Sazra is to have more scripture readers. Um, to, 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 to be a scripture reader, you have to have served, you have to love to share your faith, you have to be wise. And um, we've got 16 scripture readers. We'd love to have uh, 25 in the next few years because there are so many needs, um, great needs, and so on. Um, there are other things I can mention, but I'm kind of conscious of time, so I won't. So thanks for your support. Um, thanks for your prayers. Volunteer role is simply somebody who's willing to get our magazines in the church mm -hmm. and give them out, um, and also just to share our prayer requests from time <laughs> to time. And I think that's it. Thanks so much. Um, okay, before we come to... Um, um, read God's word again and consider it. Let's just pray. Our gracious and our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gospel work which you have preserved for the best part of 200 years. And we think of scripture readers being lords even in the Crimean War, in World War I, in World War II, but even today, Scripture readers sharing uh, their faith with men and women of the armed forces. And we ask for your blessing upon that work. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing upon us now as we come to your word. We ask you might feed our souls. May we truly know what it is to draw near to God and to know you speaking to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read a few verses from... Um, the end of Mark chapter 4, the end of Mark chapter 4, well-known words from verse 35, where we read, On the same day, when evening had come, he, that's Jesus, said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they'd left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? So in, in the time that remains this morning, I'd like us to consider this well-known account of Jesus calming the storm. And you may be aware that this account is recorded in Matthew's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, and Luke's Gospel. But there is one small detail that Mark includes which is absent from the other Gospel writers. It's that one small detail I'd like to comment on this morning. But before I do that, and whilst you're considering and thinking about what that detail might be, Let's remind ourselves of the picture that all three gospel writers paint for us in this story. Jesus has been teaching. It's been a very busy and challenging day. And at, towards the end of the day, Jesus says, let us go across to the other side. Let us cross over. And that's not a simple task. Galilee is seven miles across east to west. It's 13 miles north to south. And as you'll know, 
It's a lake subject to sudden storms and gales of great ferocity. And at certain times, um, it is a very dangerous place to be. And this night, Jesus is asleep, exhausted by the physical exertions of the day, and a great windstorm comes. And the boat is in danger of being overwhelmed. It's a passage of contrasts, great contrasts. The disciples are afraid. Lord, the Lord Jesus is quietly calm. They fear for their lives. He is asleep. They're panicking. He is peaceful. They're anxious. He is patient. And most telling of all, they're helpless. They're helpless in the storm. And that's contrasted with his power. There's nothing they can do. No wonder at the end of the passage, we're told they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So my question for all of us this morning is this, is do you know what it is to be in a storm? And of course, I'm not speaking about those awesome, powerful physical events that we, we know from time to time and even in the, in, the, in the news this week in Florida. No, I'm speaking about storms that come into our lives. Do you know what it is to have a storm in your life? A time when a great windstorm has risen. You feel your boat is filling. You feel at the point of sinking. And what is more, you feel helpless against the elements that are raging all around. And that's why we read from Psalm 107 <coughs> earlier. You see, Psalm 107 is a psalm about storms in life. It's about trouble. It's a psalm which gives a very honest assessment of life. It tells us there are storms and there will be storms. They're expected. And they're expected because there's something not right in our world. There's something out of sync. We're not right with the God who made us. And so trouble will come in some form or other. So the psalmist speaks about a world in trouble. People in different circumstances in trouble, sometimes victims of their, of their own uh, circumstances, bringing trouble upon their own head. Um, a constant theme of trouble. Now, we didn't read all the psalm. It's a long psalm. But four times the psalmist says the people in, in trouble, in desperation, cried out to the Lord and he delivered them from their distress. It's the theme of the psalm. Those who are wandering in the wilderness and desert. Those who feel they're in the desert. Those who are imprisoned, they're chained, sometimes because of their own foolishness. They're in darkness. Those who are ill, some so ill that, that they're on the point of dying. And, and those involved in commerce, they're traveling on the high seas, they're caught in a ferocious storm. You know, it's true, isn't it? There are so many who are wandering in the wilderness today. There are so many who feel imprisoned, so many who feel in darkness. And this is constant theme. Men and women trusting in themselves and their own wisdom, quite overcome. But in their trouble, they cry out to God and the Lord hears their cry. The remarkable thing is not so much that they cry out to God, but that he has such compassion upon them. He hears their cry. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivers them from their distress. And then there's that remarkable description, graphic description of a storm lifting travelers up to the heavens, plunging them down to the depths. Their courage melts away. They're at their wits end, which means that all their wisdom has been swallowed up. They don't know what to do. The whole situation is out of their control, but they cry out to God 
and they discover that God's steadfast love endures forever. God is good even in the midst of a terrible storm. God is good. Do you know what it is to be in a storm like that? When you feel all your wisdom is swallowed up. You see, how we respond to a storm in life is, is somewhat of a thermometer of our standing with God and of our faith. It's a way of reading, I suppose, our spiritual temperature because in many ways there's a great division at this point between men and women. You see, there are those who follow the pattern of the psalm, who cry out to God in their trouble, in their helplessness they call upon him, but there are also those whose troubles drive them away from God to greater self-sufficiency, to confidence in themselves. Their confidence in themselves is shaken, but not overcome. Now, in 1875, a man called William Henley wrote a famous poem. I wonder if you know it. You will recognise his conclusion. It's a famous poem. He speaks of his unconquerable soul. You can't defeat him, he says. He says, in the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. I've had difficult experiences, he said, but I haven't flinched. I'm unmoved. He's, he goes on and says, yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. I'm not afraid of whatever life throws at me, he says. So here's this man, William Henley. He's suffered, but he's unbowed. The storms have raged. His spirit you cannot overcome, he says. You cannot beat him. Well, he certainly had had a troubled life. At the age of 12, he had tuberculosis of the bone and he had to have his leg amputated. And in fact, interestingly enough, Robert Louis Stevenson, who knew him, it's thought his famous character, Long John Silver, was based on William Henley. He suffered regular illness. He died in a fall from a railway carriage at the age of 53. And of course, there's much in his tenacity, his courage, his desire to overcome that is admirable. But what about his conclusion? This is the bit you recognize. He said, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Really? Really was he the captain of his soul when he breathed his last and his spirit soared to worlds unknown and he returned to the God who made him? So do you feel in the midst of a storm this, e this morning? And are you like those in Psalm 107 who are crying out to God in their <coughs> trouble who can say, Lord, you are on the throne or are you like William Henley captain of your soul or so you think well here is that little detail in Mark's account I referred to earlier in the passage about the great storm on the lake of Galilee in Mark chapter 4 there's a little detail in verse 36 where we read now, when they'd left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And other little boats were with him. The storm will rage, but there are other boats on the lake that night. Other boats in the storm. As Jesus slept, there were other boats struggling desperately to stay afloat. I'd like to say three things briefly about Mark's little phrase, there were other boats with him. And the first is this, the Christian is not alone in the storm. The Christian 
is not alone in the trouble. There are others who are suffering too. There are others who understand the storm you go through. In fact, there are others whose circumstances seem even more challenging than your own. And I know of a Christian whose life has been devastated in the last year or so. Circumstances have led him to despair at God's dealings, a sense of God's chastening hands, a feeling of helplessness, yet deriving comfort, realizing there are other boats in the storm. He confided that in all his trouble, he considered that there were others in the storm as well, many of them overwhelmed with higher and stronger waves than he. So even in his trouble, he could reflect on God's goodness and begin to do what we uh, used to teach the children to sing, to count his blessings, to name them one by one, and to turn once more to the God who is too wise to be mistaken and too good to be unkind. What would Joni Erickson Tarder say about suffering, about storms in life? You know the young, the young lady who dived into a, a lake and broke her neck and has been a paraplegic all her life? What would she say? She says, in the early years of my paralysis, I was horrified at the prospect of remaining paralyzed for the rest of my life. But once my faith survived, God's design for my life began to dawn. My paralysis pushed me into times of prayer, often when I didn't want to pray. I can say, God's refusal to make my life easier has been my greatest blessing. So if the first thought is you're not alone in the storm, the second thought is somewhat similar. The Christian is not alone in the storm. You see, what matters is that the Lord Jesus is in the boat with you. There's a very old hymn, I don't know if you sing it, but it goes, with Christ in the vessel. I smile at the storm. That sounds a little bit superficial, doesn't it, to 2024 ears. But it's no way a superficial thought. The person who wrote that, um, he suffered much. He made many bad choices in life. He went as far away from God as perhaps it's possible to be. He's also a man of the sea. In fact, he became a Christian in the midst of a storm when he'd given up hope of rescue. No, he knew the important thing is to have Christ in the boat with you. You know the wonderful story of Pilgrim's Progress? You know how Christian found himself in the giant despair's uh, castle, in that uh, uh, dungeon, in the very depths. How did he escape? He escaped because he had in his pocket a key he hadn't realized it. He had a key called the promises of God. And it unlocked all of the doors in giant despair's castle, in doubting castle. If the Lord Jesus is in the boat with us in the storm, we can rest on his promises. They are astonishing. When you pass through the waters I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? So if the first point is the Christian is not alone in the storm, and the second point is the Christian is not alone in the storm, the third point is somewhat similar. The Christian is not alone in the storm. Did you notice how Mark adds the little detail in his gospel? He doesn't say what you would expect, that there were other boats with them, 
He says there were other boats with him. With him. There's something wonderfully personal about that phrase. Those in the storm were with him. His presence was with him. The Lord of the storm knew all the others on the lake that night. He saw all of his children in their hour of need. He knows his sheep. He loves his sheep. He calls them all by name, each one. His eye is on the sparrow and he watches over me. Now this year is the 100th year anniversary of the Paris Olympics. I know it's gone. But in 1924, a young man called Eric Little won gold uh, in dramatic fashion, refusing to run in his favoured event. What people don't know is that after the Olympics, he went to, be to China to be a missionary. And in 1945, he found himself in a Japanese prisoner of war camp with 1,800 others. It wasn't a military camp. It was a secular camp. And his role on the camp was to try to continue the education of the many, many children um, who, were, who were there. Um, and that's what he did. He, he, he organized games, studies for them as best he could in excruciatingly difficult conditions. Such was his influence in the camp that one child after he died wrote of him, we had Jesus in the camp and he was wearing running shoes. We had Jesus in our camp. But in 1945, he was dying, lying in a makeshift hospital. And there were a group of Salvation Army prisoners who would play hymns. They had their instruments. They'd play hymns outside the hospital window. And they'd send, they'd, they'd send in to him and ask him, Eric, what hymn would you like us to play for you? And very often he would ask for his favourite hymn. Be still, my soul. Now, Eric Liddell was facing his final storm. What comfort it must have been to hear those words. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief and pain. Leave to your God to order and provide in every change he faithful will remain be still my soul the winds and waves still know his voice who ruled them <laughs> while he dwelt below He's master of the storm, even of the storm that rolls. The winds and waves still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. There were other little boats with him that night in the storm. Let's close our time together by singing that hymn together. Be still my soul. The Lord is on your side.